So I want to start by giving a few caveats because I think it's important to recognize that all of what I tell you right now is not these are not hard and fast rules. Okay. They're supposed to be there are ways that I have approached debating or the idea of constructing a case. You have to find your own kind of space within that to figure out how you would like to do these things. What I can do is tell you how I have navigated through those same problems and try to come to a point where you guys can see some value in that. Learn from it if you want to. If you want to find your own method to do this, that's fine. But there are reasons why I have chosen this and I'll go through those reasons and that kind of process. And the idea will be what you like, what you can use, you should adapt. Other than that, like, let it be. No, nothing goes with that. The other part that I want to stress on is that a lot of times when we debate, there is a tendency to forget what you are doing in the room at that particular point in time. Like winning the argument overall and winning the debate is far more important than scoring points, coming across as more intelligent. Like if someone points out something that's erroneous, it's almost like showing a red flag to a goal. Even if that's completely irrelevant, the debate will often wear off into clashing on things that aren't particularly relevant to what is being discussed and won't change the decision one way or the other. But a majority of the debate will turn on like whether the color blue or red or something completely irrelevant to what the motion is about. So what I'm talk when I say constructing arguments to win debates, I'm not talking about constructing an argument in isolation and what that will look like. I think the most important skill is figuring out what case and what arguments which would fit in that case to make your point. All right. So, and I also don't want to do this in a fashion that just begins and ends with me just talking to you guys. So the idea will be I keep asking questions. What I intend to do is go through world's motions from this year. Uh, do you guys know where you can find them? Just search for WUDC 2020 motions on your phone. It will take you to that Iroku, uh, Tabby Cat, whatever thing. And you can see all the motions there. And we'll work our way downwards from the grand final because why not? So let me, can everyone, do you guys have this open? Yeah. <coughs> on your laptops or on your phones, right? So the grand final motion is, this house as China would grant universal suffrage to Hong Kong. Okay, everyone seen that? Now the first thing you should do when you see a motion is identify three specific things, okay? I identify the change that is being asked, I identify who the decision maker is and who the stakeholders are. Okay? So on a motion that this house as China would grant universal suffrage to Hong Kong, what is the change? Universal, universal Granting universal suffrage to Hong Kong. Who is the decision maker? China. 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 Right? Who are the stakeholders? Hong Kong. So, let's, this is a slightly, it's not a one answer thing, okay? So, change your right, decision maker, you're right. Now, stakeholders are many and they, their proximity to the change is different. So, for the people of Hong Kong, this is a massive and huge change. To citizens of China and Beijing, this is also an important change. To people of Singapore or the global community at large, it is also important, right? But the most important stakeholder would be the citizens of Hong Kong. But for the decision maker, are they the most important stakeholder? No. For the decision maker, is this China again? Yeah. Right? So you recognize that there is a hierarchy of importance for the decision maker and you identify who the stakeholders are in general with an understanding that there is a spectrum. Like you don't have to absolutely accord like 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10 importance or any of that. But you recognize that say the importance to the citizens of Hong Kong might be more important than like people in East Timor. Okay? People in East Timor, for some absurd reason, might be stakeholders, but they're not the most important stakeholders in the room in that debate, right? So once you've identified these three things, you have another set of clear limitations that come from it, right? If I am talking about China as a decision maker, for the decision maker, I can identify some interests, I can identify some constraints, and I can identify some patterns, right? So with China, what are China's interests? With, in respect to Hong Kong, right? Like not China's interest in general. Stability in Hong Kong. It's the maintenance of China. Suppose, but I think you guys are missing an important step, which is what is the current interest of China, right? The fact that there are protests going on in Hong Kong for several months now, that this has continued to be something of an embarrassment 
for China at the international stage, right? So its interests are in stopping the protests. Its interests are in bringing stability back. And given that Hong Kong has, as someone pointed out, like it's an important middle ground to Hong Kong and like to for China to access the world, actually more for the world to access China through Hong Kong through for investments and whatnot. So therefore, there is some importance in them preserving Hong Kong as like a middle ground, right? What are the constraints? If China gives too much freedom to the people in Hong Kong, the people in Xinjiang and other parts of China might then be more emboldened to make a case for their own sort of autonomy or for them to have some right to vote, which they don't at present, right? That's a constraint. The other constraint is comes to like the question of patterns, right? China is an authoritarian or somewhat autocratic regime. It doesn't brook dissent a lot. The pattern has always been that where it has found dissent, it has squelched it quite harshly and that by virtue of squelching it, it has managed to continue. Therefore, breaking that pattern, which is to concede to some demands from China, would be problematic for them at a larger scale, right? So moving on, so when you identify the interests, constraints and patterns, you begin to have a clearer picture of what's going on, right? So to reframe the motion in that context, it would be this house is China, given its desire to continue to use Hong Kong as a stepping ground to allow investment into its country, all right? To also prevent the protests or the sentiment behind the protests from continuing to be an embarrassment to China. This house says China would grant universal suffrage to the citizens of Hong Kong. Now by virtue of this, the first few arguments would almost begin suggesting themselves. Let me give you what, like, let me tell you what this suggests to me. First, that if I'm saying that this will help bring stability to Hong Kong, I have to show that my move would help bring stability. Given that I know my constraints, I will have to argue that this won't be such a break from China's pattern that other parts of China won't just erupt in conflict, right? And if I do these things, I am likely to be able to win the debate. If I can prove that granting universal suffrage to Hong Kong would end protests, if I am able to prove that over and above ending those protests, it will continue to allow Hong Kong as it is right now to invest into China and to be an important part of China's like economic makeup or like its economic geography or the market system that it belongs to, that would be important, correct? So essentially these cases build themselves, but the most important role becomes that of the first speaker in putting these sorts of constraints across. Because what you'd ideally like in a debate is that as the first speaker of either the government or the opposition, you set out the framework of what the you and the other team needs to prove. Right? So if you're PM on this motion, it would be best for you to go up and set up this, I mean, in, in my understanding of it, it would be best for you to go up and set up this case with these constraints and pattern and say that if I am able to prove to you, if we are able to prove to you as opening government or as gov bench for like a nation's motion, that A, this will not be problematic for China in the long term, that B, this will allow Hong Kong to remain what it is, like a middle ground between China and the world, then we have won this debate, right? So then it becomes the obligation of the opposition to contest that. Either prove that these are not the most important factors in the debate, or to show that there are other constraints that haven't been looked at. And that makes it easier for you because as a government, you are arguing on the ideas that you brought forth, right? And that you are prepared for. Because if you construct this case, you know that they are likely to bring up the idea that what will happen to people in Xinjiang, universal suffrage is not available to Chinese citizens. You know that you have an important stakeholder in Hong Kong citizenry, but it's not the most important stakeholder, right? Because we talked about that like, China would probably care more about the billion plus citizens in all of mainland China as opposed to the 16 odd billion in Hong Kong, right? So because of that, I think it becomes important for you to remember that, right? And to keep that in mind. So that gives you an idea of how the case construction should happen from the beginning. So let's take the next motion on the list. Can someone read it out? This house believes that the United States government should seek the authority to prosecute criminal files involving African Americans as either victims or alleged perpetrators to give African American interest groups and allocate funding for Right. So what is the change? 
Did you thought it would cause you to a different community based uh, system or body? No, that's, that's a step. The outcome is that you are basically saying that there will be a separate justice system. So the change is that criminal prosecutions for a certain section of your society will be handled in a different way and that those people will be the ones judging you. Correct? Yeah. That's the change. Who is the decision maker? The, the United States. States. Stakeholders? Um, the yeah, African Americans yeah. within the United States. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Anything else? The justice system? Kind of, but like, because you're affecting citizens, that's just like a meta construction on top, right? Okay. Not not the most important thing in the universe. Okay. But, for example, are the is the average citizen of the United Kingdom affected? Mm. No, no. No? So you can understand the patterns and constraints it sets up. This is not a debate about international affairs, right? Yeah. You can use examples from abroad and that's fine. But it should not be the most important aspect of a debate, right? Yeah. And we're clear on that. So then it becomes a decision maker. What are the decision maker's interests? What is the United States government's interests? Uh, and remember, you're defining this. This is not like what is real politic. Like you are capable of coming up and saying, the biggest and primary interest of a government is to ensure justice to all its citizens, right? We believe and we will prove to you that the closest form of justice that can be brought to these individuals from African American communities is being judged by their peers who are other African Americans because they are the ones who are closest to their lived experiences. Therefore, as the United States government, to achieve the goal of justice for all, we will allow this to happen in this fashion, right? That's an acceptable kind of case statement and that opens you up to a bunch of arguments about the idea of like the black or African American ex life experience, why it means that only those people should be judging you, why those interest groups are the best people to be understanding what your place is. You can also understand like the problems of status quo will lend to a large amount of argumentation. Right? Like currently what the problem is people don't understand what it's like to be in a black community. Like if you aren't say armed and you're living in a sketchy neighborhood, that might be a problem. The fact that like there might be criminals everywhere around you, that as children you often see that the only people around you with money or disposable income are drug dealers, like in ghetto areas, right? So, I mean, there are, it's very stereotyping, and it's, it's, it's a bit mean and whatnot, but the idea is when it comes to a debate, because you define and set the constraints, you are supposed to present a prejudiced picture of the universe that you're speaking of, right? So you tend, when you speak of these things, to speak of the most extreme case and that makes it easier for you to make your argument. But when you're setting up the framework, be sure to involve everything, right? Because you're speaking to a larger whole, you're not only speaking about African Americans. Because the first thing opposition will come up and say, are you saying all African Americans live in ghettos? Are you saying the only successful African American role models are drug dealers? Like what are you on about? And then you can always respond by saying, not all, but a substantial majority of African American role models are have had some interrelation with like drug dealing or illegal activities, largely because even the hip hop or rap culture, which is actually the source of the largest number of them, has that interrelation with drugs and these things. They keep speaking of these things, so to ignore that influence is bad. But we're getting into the argument now. The idea is clear to you guys. Should we try another motion then? Okay, so third motion. The South would abolish the private ownership of housing property in major metropolitan areas. Okay. Who is, what is the change? The abolishment of private ownership. So the removement, uh, removal of private property rights in a metropolitan area. Who is the decision maker? The but a generic one, right? Not a specific government. A state. A state. So you can even say the municipal body. Like, yeah. So you recognize that you as government have the freedom to pick all the way up because that has not been specified, right? Mm -hmm. Who are the stakeholders? Private so, <coughs> owners of housing <coughs> property <coughs> and also those who do. Right? And are there any other stakeholders? Other cities? Any potential are, private? Other cities who are not metropolitan. Right? So, one of the arguments you could make is if I live in Lucknow and they say all the major metropolitan areas will now no longer have private property in Lucknow for now, I mean, can we meet in Lucknow? Whatever. Uh, whatever. Some some tier two or tier three city without like prejudice to tier two or tier three city. Right? Uh, if a tier two or tier three city there is private ownership, you would actually see a fall in investment because people would be worried that I invest today and tomorrow the government is just going to take away my private ownership rights 
So that would be a problem, right? So there are other stakeholders. Not as important. The residents of the city are the primary stakeholder. But there will be others, right? So it's important to know where that will go because usually the next most important stakeholders where oppositions attack will come from. Right? Because you will say that for the people of Bombay, it would be better if there is no private ownership of property. You could have like a lease kind of situation that would prevent rent seeking arrangements, that would prevent like I don't know, uh, people in prime residential areas from like making sure that they have a huge mansion and not being able to allocate it or give it to other people who might be needing it, like there'll be some one Again, I don't know why I keep going to that, like negative speed of that. But there could be one aged uh, Parsi lady who had a family clan of like 80 people and she's the only one left and she has control over like 500 acres of prime land in the middle of the city. How is that a good thing, right? And she just says, it's my only wish to live alone on the land of my like ancestors. You say, okay, but there are, you know, 50,000 people outside who could really do with like a small corner and a bed to stay. Will you let that happen, right? I think you decide whether or not to go into the compensation idea or the practicalities of it based on what is important, right? Now is that, in this debate specifically, I would personally opt for something like, there are already, um, you know, land, like land uh, reallocation rules and procedures that are in place in any civilized society, like the government exercises a certain amount of right over property and can throw people out, like when there are development projects, etc. We will set up a system that compensates people for their private property ownership in the same way for the one time, right? Like whoever owns property in that city or within those metropolitan areas, and we will do it. So that saves me the time and effort of figuring out that there will be a council, it will decide on per square foot area and value of property, it will give 80% of the value of property to people. You say, as in where we think it's feasible and it makes sense given. Uh, pressures of like say residential pressure, we can come up with an objective criteria of like uh, population density, inequality, like homelessness. When it reaches a particular threshold, at that point this rule will apply to any major metropolitan area within our control. In which time we will compensate everyone for property. You can even have a, like let's see, the minute you start going into it, you will understand that there are other things. You can say, even only do it on necessity. It is not that we will abolish private property for everyone. If you have a home, and you are living in it, that's fine, continue living in it. We just exercise the right that if you occupy so much land that is problematic, to take that away from you, compensate you for that and make sure that other people get to live there. So that when people don't go up and say, but I was not bothering anyone, I had this nice little fountain, you gave it to me, <laughs> please beggar us. None of that rubbish, right? So the reason why you bring in practicality can't just be to bring in practicality. If it doesn't help you win the debate, don't get it. Find the easiest way to get the idea across to not get caught in difficulties. Like as I said in the beginning itself, a lot of debates will eventually if you go down the practicality route, if you spend a lot of time building up a model, would spend with the leader of opposition and say, where will you get this community from? That committee will have one Ambani person. When you have one Ambani person, Antila will go to whom? Ambani. Yeah. Look at that. You don't want to get into that problem. And so this avoids those sorts of externalities. The more generic you make it, the more defensible it becomes, which is a problem with parliamentary debating. But since you want to win and not like save the world, it's okay. Right? So moving past that, um, let's try to do the next one a little differently. What we'll do is we'll go through the motion and we'll go through figuring out Prime Minister's arguments as a next step from that. Okay? So yeah. in this motion, like, what is the impact that both sides are looking at by, by this policy? Sure. So the thing is, most times the change in the impact is quite clear. So universal suffrage in Hong Kong is clear, right? In this case, you have to extrapolate the outcome that the motion centers are asking for because it's not clear in the motion, which is why I said population pressure. So you have to figure out, like, why would you want to take private ownership away? It's a major departure from what is normal, right, in the city. What is exclusive about metropolitan areas as opposed to all other areas? Usually denser population, larger sets of homeless people. Because property prices are high and standards of like like expenses related to basic living are high, right? So therefore, it's easy to imagine that the people who came up with this motion were speaking about this outcome. But there are motions in which that's not necessarily very clear. Like this house would abolish zoos is a uh, like people keep making fun of that as a motion because it's old on like I don't know means and stuff. But um, when you think about the idea of this house would abolish zoos, it's not clear who you're doing it for, right? You have to figure out what is wrong with the idea of zoos 
for you to have clarity on what you should be arguing. So some motions will give you universal suffrage in Hong Kong. Ye change hai. Iska tum samjho ki like kya hona hai, right? That's not clear with this one. But again, as I said, you have to extrapolate. In this one, the extrapolation that comes most easily and reasonably to me is the idea that it will help uh, homeless people or like you know, it will help with income inequality, basically, right? So how about like why don't you go ahead uh, read out the next? This house prefers a brave new world to the status quo in the lesser liberal democracy. Yeah. So this is a great example of I don't know what the heck is going on that motion, right? Uh, there's an oh, there's an info yeah. site. That probably would happen. Yeah. <laughs> a brave new world has these characteristics. One, people are genetically engineered and socially conditioned by the state for specific so, uh, societal goals. Mm -hmm. Second, people's material and physical needs are unfallingly met. Third, there is no possibility of changing the social order. Okay, so this makes the change very clear, right? It's very stark. It essentially means a universe where there is no social mobility, where you are genetically preordained or designed to fulfill specific social or economic roles, right? And that's a brave new world being spoken of, right? That's clear. The decision maker isn't clear. Probably the state. The state. Why? Uh, because they'll be controlling who gets what job. And they have control of the society. If it's genetically preordained, the idea would be. What this brave new world concept seems to be speaking of is a false meritocracy, right? What we have is a meritocracy which assumes that because of like market forces, because of social forces, whatever, people end up getting into the roles that they ought to or that they are most attuned towards. There is some error rate, but people like he care. Like you would have been a better accountant, but you like kuch aur karo to chal jayega. That's sort of thing, right? Like good. I wonder if you switched Amit Shah and Ambani, like what would Reliance and what would BJP be like? But anyway, what I mean is that there are people who get put into specific roles, and then there's the idea that they are good for certain roles, and there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between those two things, right? When you understand that, this motion is largely about saying we've come up with a mechanism that achieves that. Now you compare these two and tell us which is better. So as government, you get to decide whether, as a state, at the cusp of such technology that would make it possible. Should you choose that, or should, as a general rule, human society just be all this like existential angst is too painful? Nobody wants this. Like I am writing poems about like what my future will be like twenty years from now, or what my role in life is. You get born, you are told you are going to be a janitor, and so all your life you spend training to be a janitor. You are taught to be happy about being a janitor. You are a happy janitor. You die as a happy janitor. Janitor has done right. Like so, that's the comparison that's being made. <coughs> And so you have to be able to argue within that comparison, right? So here we have a change. We don't have a clear decision maker. That's a decision you have to make. Who would you prefer having as a decision maker? A state or a generic like understanding of citizenry? Assume that there is no hypothetical vote out there, and we start from. Yeah, and so you say that. You say, that's actually a great way of putting it. You say what we imagine this debate to be is a hypothetical vote in this room about whether we would prefer a world as described in the info slide or whether we prefer our world today. Hmm. Can the debate go on how people will not be happy with this change? Like she talks about a hypothetical when everything starts afresh. Or can the debate be about how now Western democracy has to change to this new style? Can that be a fair premise to run the debate on? No, that would largely depend. So because for example if I speak about Western liberal democracies today and how they would change to this. Yeah. That questions whether that motion is a feasible one or not. Huh. Okay. You understand, right? Yeah. Like the presumption is if a motion is presented to you, that it is at least possible, okay. or that you can imagine it to be possible, mm -hmm. or you can imagine a scenario where it's possible. So what Anjali imagined was a scenario in which that's possible, because a hypothetical global vote of human beings to decide whether you want to develop that kind of society or whether you don't, mm -hmm. right? So that's why the mechanisms of kaise hoga. Is probably secondary, especially since the motion presumes it's possible, right? And if someone like Elidor, how will you do it? They just say, listen, like Hajkora said, are you are you insulting them? Are you insulting them? What stuff like that, right? Okay, so let's let's dive a little deeper into this motion. Okay, so as I said, the change is clear. We have to decide on a decision maker. We have one option, which is to say everybody. The option of the state deciding that any takers. Okay. 
over the idea of how like chaotic society has become because of the kind of questioning that goes into people thinking about their goals and dreams and aspirations and how stability would be ensured when we get rid of that. Yeah, but how would that fall within a state's prerogative? Because state, the state would always want more stability for productivity and ensure that like people are working more, which means that people are producing more to survive. But is, is that the beyond, like is that the primary motivation of a state? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The idea is we, we often construe the state to optimize and maximize for that. But the reason they optimize and maximize for that is for happiness. States presume that a productive and a society in which there's lots of money and like all of those things are increasing is a better and happier one. If like Bhutan manages without that, right, that gross national happiness nonsense. So whatever. Like I'm just trying to prove that though that Bhutan is not a very good example of anything per se because it's so isolated and exotic. But the idea becomes when we speak about this, why would a state want to make this decision? Your government, you have to argue it. It's not just a question of whether a state should do so or not, right? Why would a state do it? And the reason why I think uh, the, the construction of people deciding to do it would be easier is because a state would often be, like, you would question a state as to why are you deciding to not protect the rights of people to make those choices or why are you not maximizing choice for your citizens. So I think that's a threshold that would become difficult to cast it in the garb of the decision maker being the state. So if you had to make that choice, make the strategic choice, probably, I would make the strategic choice of going for like a group, like groups of individuals deciding that for society, okay? So that's a decision maker, alright? So you have the change, you have the decision maker. What are the stakeholders? This is people. People? Just people? Okay. Any other stakeholders? The state. The state. Yeah. 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 Now the idea is if you live in a completely preordained society, okay, where everything is kind of fixed for you, your role in society, etc. Does that also mean that there will be a hierarchy? Does that also mean that there will be, say, the like differences and inequalities? Yeah. Why? Because, because there are certain notions attached to certain work. Why are those notions attached to that work? Because the idea is that certain, like, like the idea of how the Varna system evolved in terms of it's just you're near the dirt and that's why you're a dirty person as a like, lower class individual. It just materializes those ideas into like, legitimizing. Sure, and that is the reality we live in, right? But that's the that's the opposite of what we are trying to achieve. Correct? Like this motion requires of you to imagine a completely different universe in which that's not the case. Now the reason if, if it had to be put to you, if like if you were asked and you were given a day with all the resources in the world to figure out who was the best cardiologist, do you think you'd be able to do it? There would be like rankings, there would be some understanding, like based of experience, there would be some people who got awards, you could set up like a competition, like best cardiologist type, like quiz, I don't know, what, whatever would work, right? But it's possible for you to establish who that person is, A, based on things that exist, and be based on like some way of mechanizing it, right? Can you tell me who the best sweeper in the world is? The, the reason why the Varna system evolved or why these like hierarchies evolved were because certain careers or certain economic roles and social roles were more difficult to access than other roles. In a universe where there is preordained access, you could imagine that there is no hierarchy because there would be an inherent value to the work you do. Like, if I sweep, I am the sweeper. Right? So, that becomes the new world in which you are debating, which is why that analysis is a good way of dealing with opposition. So, you say all those problems that exist in, like, the understanding of dignity of labor as a concept would be better enabled in a situation where it's preordained, so value can be ascribed based on what you are doing, not how hard it was for you to get there. Yeah? But I still think that there is an encounter in terms of even when, like you can make this argument even today, saying that again, like as a woman, if I don't raise a child, I don't raise a child. But still, there is a connotation attached to the work that you do, even when there is an equality in the work that like, like, there are equal number of people doing it. The other part of it is like patriarchy. And I think in the idea of a brave new world, it's very difficult to fit that in, right? Like I don't know, with dignity of labor, at least it gives you a good straight response to that. My response to patriarchy as a problem would be, 
वो इस दुनिया में भी है उस दुनिया में अगर होगा तो होगा लाइक इट डजेंट चेंज द फैक्ट दैट दीज रोल्स आर प्री ऑर्डे इज नॉट ऑन अ जेंडर बेसिस इट्स ऑन अ फिटमेंट बेसिस सो इफ वी रेकग्नाइज दैट देर इज लेस लाइकली टू बी डिग्निटी ऑफ लेबर इशूज वी कैन इमेजिन दैट either patriarchy will continue to be as big a problem or it won't be a problem it won't get worse because of this new system right so the idea is again a strategic avoidance of thorny issues is a fantastically important skill to learn in the bits yeah but then like uh, in the dream new world if as if uh, uh, if everyone is going to be happy at the end of the day can we assume that the hierarchy and discrimination won't exist or will it will cease to exist because they are happy at the end of the day are you saying nobody is happy today because of patriarchy I think men are very happy because of the patriarchy. Because there's someone better than you at your job, or like there's someone with a better job. That's why they're not happy. Yeah, but then the idea of better jobs go away, so that becomes dignity of labor. But the idea of gender discrimination does not necessarily lend itself to dignity of labor, right? Like you could have male sleepers, you could have female sleepers, you could have male cardiologists, female cardiologists. The idea that like a woman should be in the kitchen won't be helped one way or the other. By preordain of who is going to be in the kitchen. Or not. But if a woman is happy cooking in the kitchen, like that's an opposition argument to say that some people derive happiness from the pursuit of happiness, like the, from achievement, from setting up like this is where I am today, this is where I want to be tomorrow, this is where I want to be day after, right? And that genetic preordainment can't be so strong as to overcome human nature absolutely. But that's a that's a well constructed opposition argument, I think. When you're constructing your government case, that's something to look forward to, but you can't pay so much attention on it that you don't construct your case to begin with, right? So to start with again, and I think we've gotten a little lost in the clouds here. Let's pull it back a bit. So the Gov case on this motion is what we know the the decision maker in this case is a lot more abstract, but we're talking about people in general, right? So what are their interests? Remember the change is to remove all struggle and existential angst, right? So, what are your interests? You want to remove struggle and existential anger? Be happy, be satisfied. Right. So, you say that all of humanity has been a pursuit for satisfaction and happiness. It is very safe to assume that the vast majority of people fail in their objective of achieving satisfaction and happiness in today's world. That when over, like, around sixty percent of the world's population lives at like you know, not poverty rates, but still in. subsistence kind of existence that is not a particularly good way for the universe to exist that there is massive disparity in how resources are allocated and that disparity largely comes from the accident of birth and the further qualification of the accident of birth by um, education access to education access to uh, i don't know higher learning and therefore access to more lucrative positions in society and that the removal of this and therefore allowing for a your merit based system that deals more with your genetic makeup and the outcome that it's hoping to achieve is better right so if you set up the debate like that you're far more likely to deal with a lot of the initial arguments that are coming from elo because you say the basic objective of our debate is to maximize satisfaction and happiness and we think satisfaction and happiness is best achieved when people get to do what they are best supposed to do. say there is an entire ecosystem and industry that exists in present day society pretending that what everyone is destined to become is an iit iim graduate which is just not the case right a vast majority of people don't achieve that and by setting up these sorts of like aspirational goals for entire generations upon generations of citizenry all you are doing is ensuring that 99% of people who hit the age of 24 think they are a failure how is that a good thing right in the alternate world that government is proposing you have a universe where people are able to know right at the point of like adulthood what they are supposed to be are guaranteed a certain amount of comfort are guaranteed a certain amount of like accomplishment within that field and will just continue to go achieve that right now what is opposition's main argument you think the right choice, choice. Okay, choice is one. You were saying something different. Same, same choice. Anything else? Why is choice important? <coughs> we thought choice was good because we thought that the person was the best arbiter or judge mm. of what is good for them, right? Like liberal democracies are premised on the idea that you will be best equipped to decide what is good for you. Now that's no longer the case in this universe. <coughs> 
not a question of do you like vanilla or chocolate ice cream and it's a personal taste. You are genetically being determined according to the info slide with 100% accuracy as to what you are supposed to be doing. So the system will give you the vanilla ice cream. Like it won't mess around, it won't give you too many options, it won't confuse you. Right? So therefore, I think choice is not the strongest argument. Right? Like okay, let's let's switch it around. Your opposition. Okay? What is the different kind of comfort? Different kind of different kind of comfort, the way they are living, that's different. So the inequality in the way they are living. No, but the idea is why would there be inequality in this future world? Yeah. Also, there would probably be no progress in society because people will not want to work and do better. They will continue to stagnate. This the stagnation is probably the strongest argument on opposition. You have no reason to struggle or progress, right? Uh, to that, could the uh, like, uh, stagnation will only happen when uh, you don't want to progress within your own field as well. Even within your own field, you always want to do better. So, how do we prove that stagnation will necessarily happen? And you don't have a freedom to choose between different fields. No, no sir. But like a sweeper can't go beyond this. There won't be new ideas, right? How can you have new ideas in sweeping? How can like there are some fields that are more attuned towards new things, but even those new things come from a desire to prove to the universe that you are the best scientist. Like you compete for prizes. You you have fields medals. You have Nobel prizes. You have an entire uh, ecosystem that's been constructed purely around the idea of that your occupation is in different fields, right? That your occupation is a major driving factor for a lot of people. If you know that your occupation is you are a rocket scientist, uh, then you don't need anyone else to tell you. The state bloody gave you a certificate saying when you are two, you are going to be a rocket scientist. You grew up knowing you are going to be a rocket scientist. You became a rocket scientist. Like what is there to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And it, it might even go so far as saying you will be a mediocre rocket scientist, you will work for the top rocket scientist. So you will even have less reason to strive, right? So that progress point I think is the strongest argument from opposition, right? Does that make sense? So you see, what happens is that when you construct a case with this kind of reasoned logic, the debate will become very clear to you in prep time itself. And because the debate will become very clear to you in prep time itself, it becomes the starting point of being able to construct effective arguments to win debates. Because you have to keep two things in mind when you are constructing an argument. Okay? One, what are you trying to do and achieve with that argument? What are you trying to prove? And you can't forget that. The biggest problem that like I saw while I was debating you guys, I think, was that people would often forget why they were arguing a particular point. They would focus so much on the argument in itself or proving certain limbs of the argument that they forget the overarching like, goal of that argument. And the second question to keep in mind is what are you trying to prove in the debate? Like your argument only has relevance as far as it filters into the debate and helps you prove a point, right? And those two things have to be kept in mind. So uh, can we, can either of you read out the next motion? This house believes that developing countries should acquire on the open market large stakes in major publicly traded global corporations. Example Google, JP Morgan, Shell, and Fantastic. Okay. So guys, who is the what is the change? Acquiring do, do countries do that right now? Uh, some countries. Yeah. How do some countries do it? They have to take to big companies. But how? Like does like like as in, there's, there's this thing called a sovereign so, wealth fund. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Sorry, as in, there's no point. Like, yeah, there's something called sovereign wealth fund. Um, yeah. Some countries have it, like countries like Norway has a huge yeah, sovereign yes. wealth fund. Yeah. Saudi Arabia has a huge one which has invested buttloads in SoftBank and Uber. Mm. Uh, you know, stuff like that. So, most, like, lots of countries have sovereign wealth fund. Malaysia has okay. But that ran into a lot of trouble, right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's, yeah. that's the reason why we know of it. So, some countries have sovereign wealth fund, some countries don't. The countries that have sovereign wealth funds are they usually developing, developed? What are they? Malaysia, but they also have lots. Saudi Arabia to develop, nahi The idea is some countries have sovereign wealth funds largely because they were sitting on a buttload of cash and they didn't know what to do with it. Norway had oil cash, so they did it. Malaysia had oil cash, so they did it. Saudi Arabia has oil cash, so they did it. Okay. Starting point is recognition that. Sovereigns can create wealth funds. How big they are and how effective they are largely depends on how what's the size of the fund they are able to develop. Okay. 
uh, what's the rest of the motion please? In uh, large publicly traded corporations, right? Yeah. So the change is to allow people to, like allow countries to make speculative kind of bets, mm-hmm. right? Because trading in the market is a speculative bet, right? Like the stock, will, it, the stock can go up or down, the company can shut down tomorrow, you can lose lots of money in the stock market. So the change is speculative investments by governments, large, like put as simply as possible. Who are the stakeholders? All the people of the country. Hmm? The citizens and the state. Like the state will be the mechanism that activates it, right? Like the idea of the wealth fund will make the decisions for it, etc. Right? Okay. Now, what are the problems with this setup as government? Like you're proposing this, okay? This is not something you're looking at in abstract or YouTube. You have to give reasons why developing countries should make this sort of thing happen. And you know opposition, the first thing you say, governments in developing countries can barely find their own ass before breakfast, right? Mm-hmm. How on earth are they going to go around making investment decisions and speculative decisions that don't lose large amounts of money? So as government, you should be prepared to respond to that? How should you respond to it? We frame them on the debate by saying that only those countries who have some amount of funding will choose. The assumption is even if like Malaysia messed up their sovereign wealth fund pretty royally anyway, right? Like, huh. okay. so, problem. It's not a question of having access to liquid money. Okay. It's a question of what the decision making process is for those people and whether that's a smart one or not. So ordinarily leaving a motion alone, if you say that the government or the prime minister or some mechanism that comes out of it will make those decisions, do you think that's a good strategic move to make or not? See, it's always like good to have a safety end because developing countries are the most vulnerable to like you know, a- absolutely. And when they have foreign investment in these huge companies, you have a safety net uh, like if you cut off your economy or something. That's a that's a great like blue chip stocks are looked at as and what they seem to be discussing are blue chip stocks, right? Large publicly traded companies, but. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is an important point. I'll just revisit it. What I was stressing on before this was, who will decide what to invest in? Which blue chip stock? Should it be the government? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Is the government good at making decisions? No, but they are inherently the ones that make the decisions. So it's easier to allocate that. Do we not have autonomous bodies that make decisions? But yeah. this, like is, when this is on like, behalf of the country, right? You're doing this on behalf Are of the country. Are you Indian Olympic Committee like Modi ki nahi sunti na? Because usko bhaga de. 56 inches, you should be doing short part of it. Doesn't happen, right? Yeah. But the autonomous committee also does come under the umbrella. Sure, but the idea is, as government, and remember, you're arguing this now. You're not neutral about this idea, right? As government, you're looking to find a way to maximize your ability to make this argument. <coughs> One thing you know you're likely to face from opposition is that they will say, how will this government do anything? It is a stupid government. Okay. Your best response to this would be, we will hire the smartest people in the world, the best investors and they will invest. <coughs> it will be run like a private equity fund, a VC fund, whatever. Any of those sorts of people who do it well, who do it professionally and who tend to have much better returns. You can even say we will steal Warren Buffett, we will kidnap him, North Korea's like level stuff and put him in a room, we will connect lots of algo- like machine learning algorithms to his head, we will replicate his brain and we will make that machine learning algorithm make decisions, whatever. The point is to avoid the obvious issue which is bad decision making could scuttle this entire process, right? Because this is a problem with speculative investment, right? What he was saying, the idea is safety net, it can go the other way also. You don't want billions upon billions of your country which doesn't have that much money to be given as a developing country. You don't want to lose billions on the stock market. Because when you talk about sovereign wealth funds, it's not like uh, I lost 50,000 in the stock market like you know, uncles tend to tell you like these days. It's more about the line that a pretty crap, like I just lost all the revenue that I got from like the country in the last two years, right? Like billions, or I lost 10% of GDP. So we're talking about errors of that magnitude. <laughs> Right? So you have to account for that. So when you say that we will set up a professional system, the professional systems usually come with safeguards. Like when Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett, like, okay, contact Warren Buffett is like this very famous investor. He runs Berkshire Hathaway, which is for the last 20, 30 odd years has been seen as the most prolific and successful investor in stock markets in the universe. I mean, on earth, but 
don't think uh, alien lives would have evolved stock markets are pretty stupid. But the idea being within that context, when you're talking about say Warren Buffett and stuff, what they usually do is they hedge their bets, right? They call it a hedge fund also because that reason, the idea that you make smart bets across various industries on the understanding that kuch to chalega and the returns from the kuch to chalega will help offset losses that you might have in other places. So you say that when these large funds deploy large amounts of money, this is how they make their decisions. And the difference between a professionally managed fund like this and the difference between a, like, it will do whatever the government wants to do is the difference between Norway's sovereign wealth fund and Saudi Arabia's. Saudi Arabia pumped a lot of money into SoftBank because they were really impressed by that guy. That guy went and lost them $70 billion in WeWork. Right? Like that was not a smart use of their money at all. But Norway didn't do that because Norway has a professional body which isn't determined by leaders who like this one guy can't come and charm them with like a PowerPoint presentation and make them give like, you know, 20-30 million dollars worth of money to them. So that becomes a comparison. So you say we're not looking at like a personality driven, idiot, like, I don't know, idiot uh, conglomerate. We're talking about a sovereign wealth fund which should be run by professionals, autonomous, etc. Make sense? Cool. So if you do this, like, what do you think are the, the primary arguments? Like, why should you be doing this? What are you hoping to achieve as a developing country? Profit. 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 You're just hoping that you will be able to get the most returns for your money, right? What are the other benefits? Are there any other benefits? Some kind of some kind of gold over. If you're not talking. No, no, control over these companies. That's if you own a large stake in it, you have some sort of control in that. Is sure, that's one thing. Diversifying the fund. Diversifying? Diversifying the fund and like making it, uh, like it is not in one sector so that the growth is average and. Yeah, yeah, so you're hedging like yeah, your bets, right? Hedging it and. So therefore, the also because idle cash is no worth, it's not. Idle cash is not giving any interest. So it, See, that's a very interest. important one. Exactly. So idle cash is a problem. Like the monetary system we live in, money does, like money is a very, okay, let's just take a step back. Money is the weirdest thing in the universe. Right? It has no inherent value. It's completely speculative. Eight time thai was attached to a certain amount of gold, that time is also gone. It is pure hogwash. Like can you imagine that there is this commodity that everyone runs after and its value keeps decreasing over time and it's designed that way. Inflation is a thing. Like nobody understands any of how this monetary system works. People lend money, people use it to understand everything about human beings and corporations and whatnot. But there is no clarity on what it is. That's why the idea of idle money is weird. If I have this much of value put in a box, how can it be that nothing changes inside the box? What was inside the box is the same, but six months later the value of that has gone down. Right? Therefore value as a concept has changed. And the idea that you're sitting on a lot of resource no longer is as good as it used to be because that resource value keeps changing over time. One of the best ways for a government to try to combat this or to protect their resources from this kind of downside risk of like, like the one example is, um, keep forgetting the name. There is an island near uh, Australia where they're building those prison populations. What is the name? Does anyone remember? Nauru. There's an island called Nauru which is just off, like not just off, it's somewhat off the coast of Australia. It became like a huge um, economic powerhouse because it was some, like, let me just check because I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I think they had copper or they had tungsten or they had a particular resource that was very, very much in uh, demand back, I think limestone or something. And so people came, mined the heck out of it and left. And then that resource stopped being important. So the country like was at one point the country with the highest GDP because it had such a low population and so much in like inflow of cash. They exhausted their resources. And then they just died. There's a country and now they are basically selling off their land to Australia to run immigration prisons. So all the people who come into Australia on boats and whatever from Southeast Asia are just picked up, taken to Nauru and dumped there. Okay, so I forgot like my internet isn't working anymore. Anyway, so trust me, what? Phosphate, thank you. I knew I was close. And it is Nauru, right? Yeah, okay. I remember something correctly. Okay, so phosphate, right? So the idea is that there is, if you look at any country, there is an understanding of the value 
of the resources it has. Over time, that value might go up and down. That is also speculative. So one argument from government can be even the nature of all resources and value is speculative in the larger scheme of things. Whatever resources we have at this point should also be placed and we should be trying to optimize for returns. Therefore, having a sovereign wealth fund run professionally, hedging all its bets, can ensure that the wealth of the country is as responsibly kept and maintained as not. The comparison is between just putting it in a room and then watching it wait. And the idea isn't that because I'm putting money in a sovereign wealth fund, I won't put it into development. Right? Obviously, the higher priority would be giving the money back to citizens. Right? Sovereign wealth funds only exist as a concept of they will put some extra or whatever spillover there is into this. That place will continue making returns and profits and eventually building up a corpus that will run itself. Right? So that can be what can be government's case. Does that make sense to you guys? Think about right in terms of. Um, the so, like, can you remind me of your question again? See, like, like, is it fair to say that only countries with excess money? Understood. Yeah. So the thing is, a the motion presumes possibility, right? B it talks about developing countries. Now it's not the safe. It's not safe to say that developing countries don't have access to a lot of capital. They do. At a country level, you have access to quite substantial sums of money. Now they come in, whether they come in through tax collections, whether they come in through whatever sources of income a government has, like tax is the main one, there are all sorts of duties and imports. Yeah, but you don't have a surplus in like I mean, how do you define a surplus now? Like what normally happens is they make this much money in a year, they allocate all that money to various heads and under like in the budget and that's it. They also usually keep a certain amount of money as like RBI keeps a certain yeah. amount of funds as like uh, you know, safety net or whatever, right? The idea that we're talking about when we talk about sovereign wealth funds is that that money shouldn't just be kept as backup. You mobilize that money. It shouldn't just be, like I said, locked in a box in your safe, right? So that's the idea of the sovereign wealth fund. The presumption that there is some amount of sizable funding that is available to these developing countries other than just storing them for backup. They say, have you heard of the FAO in India? The Food and Agriculture oh, Organization. Yes. So every year it buys like substantial amounts of wheat and puts them in godowns for no reason but to keep them in godowns. And the idea is if prices of wheat go above a certain amount, they just open up those godowns and throw wheat at everybody until the price falls down somewhat. And then they close the doors again. So like a lot of countries, almost all developing countries in fact, like short of I don't know why I'm picking on East Timor, but I presume. Now you probably doesn't have any money right now. Yeah, now so Nauru doesn't have any money because it's used all its money, but whatever money it's making from the Aussie government for those prisons, not all of it is probably being spent, right? So in that sense, it's, it's safe to presume that some amount of money will exist. The quantum of that money is not that important. The comparative is between just storing it as backup or mobilizing it to fund certain things. The secondary question becomes, why should it be in blue chip stocks? Why can it not be in other instruments? Why can it not be like sovereign debt, you can give money to another country, right? So that will likely be how the debate plays out. So then it will be a comparison between two things, A, just storing the money simply or, more, or investing it. At the secondary level, if you invest it, where do you invest it, right? So as government, if you prove that it is better for you to invest the money rather than keep it, knowing that the value of money and the value of resources tends to go down to zero over a large enough period of time, right? And secondarily, you prove that the right place to invest this money, as opposed to all other alternatives would be blue chip stocks, you should win the debate, correct? So that's how you should think about it, correct? So let's, now let's make an argument uh, from this motion, all right? We've got the ideas, we have the reasons, but how do you construct an argument in itself? So, what's, what do you guys think is the strongest argument for government on this one? No, but why? That's that's how... Is profit in, it, in and of itself a desirable outcome? No, no, but... Yeah, but money for what? So the outcome is important, right? I'm just like I'm sorry, I'm pushing you towards a logical conclusion of your argument because that should come first. So why should I be doing this? I should be doing this so that I have more money to develop my country. 
as a developing country my needs are not to just maintain my needs are to grow my needs are to be able to funnel substantial amounts of money into my economy and that the amount of money i have right now say it's x may not be enough if i just throw that money into the economy it won't actually do anything but if i invest x 5 years from now i might have 3x i might have 4x or what happens 10 years from now every year i'll have x coming out simply on the profits of what i have invested to begin with and therefore i will be able to create more better development over the long term as opposed to just investing that money into my country every year right therefore the comparative of either storing it which i will need to store in any case to like prop up my currency and to make sure that you know my banks run and everything i have to store some amount of money anyway as opposed to just storing that money and not doing anything with it if i invest a proportion of it or all of it into these sorts of blue chip stocks we think that's a better way of like maintaining fiscal independence ensuring like some amount of return and therefore having money for development and what sort of development that is can depend on the developing country like gov- the government in any case is making decisions on how to allocate the money they have the money that they will additionally get from this they will also safely allocate right clear now is that a good argument Do you guys judge debates also? Have you met a judicator? That's what they do, right? Yeah, but you evaluate something in comparison from the op judges. No, the usually eva- like even if there was no op, a judge is supposed to be able to evaluate that. Mm-hmm. The idea is in and of itself, how much does an argument convince you that this should happen, right? So as I said, there were two steps. Remember, the first step, the comparison between keeping the money and investing it. and the second between investing in anywhere else and in blue chip stocks mm-hmm. this argument ticks both those boxes if correctly made you start by saying status quo is you keep the money as backup it's like kept with your federal bank or kept in your reserve it doesn't get spent anywhere okay unfortunately what happens is over time that money continues to lose value and eventually will tend to zero for a long enough period of time instead we are proposing that you invest that money because we think investing that money in optimizes for higher returns and it shows that that money doesn't keep losing value and it might give you much higher returns right given that we suggest that you put it in blue chip stocks now why blue chip stocks because it's far more stable than speculative stocks how how do you determine that that makes it just got well over a period the reason why these things are called like actually this is kind of like that uh, conversation we having about best cardiologists like blue chip stocks are called blue chip stocks because somebody has decided to call them blue chip stocks They're like the blue tick on twitter someone has given them a certain sense of authority or importance and the reason they've done that and included them in like you know those nifty 50 or what like, it sounds stupid to me like that sensex 50 which is the idea of like 50 major stocks which are used as an index to determine the performance of the overall stock market right so those stocks are considered to be the most important they're supposed to be the backbone of the stock market or like the fiscal institution so in that context why blue chip stocks why not other stocks the reason why blue chip stocks are are the one are suggested in that motion right and the reason for that is over the last 80 90 100 odd years they have tracked blue chip stocks right There's actually like the reason why they say Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway are such prolific investors is that over the last 40 years he's outperformed that index by three or four x. Okay, like अगर उनका profit करें 10 percent था इसने 40 पचास पर like percent का return मारा हुआ. So, but the idea is that that 10 percent is also a good rate of return, yeah. and that has been measured that if you invest intelligently across a large number of blue chip stocks, the pattern is very clear. right makes sense and so that answers both the questions and takes both those boxes the case be that there's an opportunity cost to this like investment and you can like have this spend this money say for example giving subsidies and stuff like that no so that's where the government's argument on like we're still talking about a particular argument right we're not talking about the whole case and in that argument i, I mentioned that every year say there's x amount of money that is put into backup right like there is put as like a reserve bank or federal reserve fund now of that x you invest some percent and you don't invest the rest 
the comparative is, is just going to stay there. If instead you say I invested into my country, we say okay, invested into your country. But what are you? How are you confident that those returns will be as good, right? So it's a question of both those things. Secondly, the returns like if we invest in our country are not going to be liquid money as compared to like when we invest. In no, but you could be investing in blue chip stocks in your own country. Na ta likha thi like yeah. So I think that, that's a separate thing. Like what? If, if what you're referring to is investment into development, that's a separate issue because that is right. It doesn't lead to returns. And the other part is, I could put X amount of like every year there's some amount of money. Instead of putting it in the Federal Reserve, I could reallocate it for development. But if instead of that I invest, and five years from now I have much more money that I can invest in one go into an intelligent place and still keep like a corpus, right? Like say I say I have a hundred bucks. Okay, for instead of investing hundred bucks in development today, I keep investing it. That hundred bucks turns to five hundred bucks. Then five years from now, I invest four hundred bucks in the economy. That is worth more than putting it just blindly into your <coughs> economy, right? That's the idea. Clear? Now the question is, we've talked about the idea, and every element of that argument has been mentioned or discussed amongst us by now. How do you construct that argument? What should it look like? What is the structure of an argument? Reasoning in the next sentence. Sure, but what is the purpose of the argument? Your structure should optimize the purpose of your argument. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's start with what the purpose of it is. Having what is development. development? What is the purpose of arguments in general in abstract, not this specific? Okay. The purpose of an argument should be to establish your point. To argue towards a particular reason, to give you a reason to do something, correct? <coughs> so, what is it that we're trying to get people to do here? Investing to no, uh, tell, convince people that this should be what uh, developing countries should do. Should right? be, yeah. So, like, how would you begin your argument? By telling why countries should do this in the world. Okay, so let's backtrack a little. So, have you? I'm sure at some point or the other you've seen old movies, right? Yeah. So, purane movie mein title aata tha, pura cast aata tha. They would go through all of that and then they start the movie, right? What happens now when you go into a movie? Or? It comes to the end. It starts with like some cool action sequence, right? Yeah. Now, unfortunately, we live in a debate world. You would start with the outcome, okay? Because outcomes are much more sticky in the judge's mind. So if you begin very cleanly and clearly with what you are trying to prove and say that in the course of my argument, I am going to prove to you that countries, it would be better for countries to invest as opposed to just keep that money given how inflation and monetary systems work and secondarily that they should be investing in blue chip stocks as opposed to other investment options to protect against a downside risk and maximize returns. Okay, These are two separate arguments. You have cleanly mentioned what they are about. So you say my first argument with respect to why a country should do this as opposed to just letting the money lie. What is the problem with status quo? The problem with status quo is that right now uh, countries just put money into these federal reserves to ensure their lending rate and to ensure that their banks and their internal financial system is robust. However, that money because of inflation continues to lose value. And given the, depending on the size of that country, the, the size of that money being reserved usually is in the billions of dollars, right? For that reason, we believe that instead of just keeping that money and letting it continue to lose value, we should find ways to mobilize that money and to maximize returns because developing countries could always do with more money for development. And this is one way to achieve that as opposed to letting this money just lose value. We think this will fundamentally better respond to the state's obligation to responsibly treat the funds of citizens, right? Because that money belongs to citizens. To just let it go waste, it would be a dereliction of the government's duty. Like if any other amount of money had just been given to a government and the government just put it in an account, it would be seen as a complete failure of that government. In a lot of ways, they measure how well a government is done by seeing what percentage of the budget was actually mobilized, right? So if there's a particular part of the budget that is designed to not be touched, we think that's problematic and we think it would be, we would live in a better world if this was mobilized, right? So that is one complete argument 
from that point. The best thing would be an example, like I tried to work one in here, but this is a very specific kind of case, right? So I talked about like hypothetical, the idea that if money was just kept in an account and the idea that like government performance is measured by budgetary constraints, right? But the idea of stating what the argument is for, what you are trying to prove, an example, and then ending by, so therefore, given that I have shown you that this money should not just be allowed to go waste in an account somewhere or be locked up in a safe, the next question is what should we do with that money? We believe we should put that in blue chip stocks as opposed to other speculative forms of investment. <coughs> what is this problem? What is the problem with status quo here? What? No, it was stagnation pehle wale ka tha. Ab like you've agreed that you want to invest it. Why blue chip stocks? So what's the problem with other investment paradigms? So this is stable or more likely to get more outcome out of it. Risky, right? Money is very important for this developing country and these investments are very risky and we cannot have it. Right. But the important thing is to say that we have to make, remember the first argument as well. Right? So you start by saying, we recognize that this money is really important. We have a responsibility as a state to ensure that it is spent in the best way possible. If we agree that it should be invested, we should not necessarily invest it in a way that only looks towards maximizing returns without looking at the risk involved. Right? So we should be very, very conscious of the risk that we are putting this money to. But we should ensure as much as we can and as professionally as possible to ensure that those returns are good. How the best way to do that would be to have a professional organization of investors set up something like a sovereign wealth fund or a hedge fund that invests in these blue chip stocks. Blue chip stocks because we've seen over time across a bouquet of blue chip stock investments, there is a regular kind of rate of return which ranges in the 8 to 12 percent over the last 40 or over time. And we think this kind of safety net where you invest in a large number of blue chip stocks to hedge your bet against economic fluctuations of various sorts or sectoral problems and you invest in different parts of the world to hedge against even like localized turbulences or drops in the stock market. We believe this would be the best way for us to arrange our investments. We believe that the performance of this, these investments can be tracked. You can have incentives for the people making these investments. We can put rules saying that you shouldn't invest in bad companies that are breaking laws in other places or that don't match the legal obligations or compliance obligations that your country would have. So we can ensure there's responsible investing, right? We can also see that in cases where the wealth, the wealth fund struggles to mobilize all its mobilize all of its resources, we can reduce or increase fund size depending on what the situation is. And over time, we believe that we will arrive at a place where there will be a steady corpus of money in this fund that will keep regularly providing returns that we can refunnel into development. Why is this better than any other form of investment? Would be the third argument, right? So if you make these three arguments, you have a pretty strong first speaker case. Does that make sense to you guys? So let's do the next motion and now you guys will make the arguments. This house prefers a world where starting today all humans will have identical intellectual abilities equivalent to the current global average. Nice. Okay. Come on. What are the steps? What do you have to do first with the motion? Identify the change. Identify the change. What's the change? Changes in intellectual abilities. This is very similar in some form to the brave new world. Yeah. Emotions, yeah. Words, yeah. Anyway. So, it's it's really the same, dude. It's here. Why do you yell at them? Throw things at them. This is shit. Basic forcing yell at them. Ah, so with respect to this motion, what is the change? Change like everyone has standardized intellectual ability. You presume possibility to like kaise hoga ye sab me nahi usna, hai na? Like you don't want like that model or like we will surgically remove parts of the brain now. None of that crap. Like we just assume that it's possible. Who is the decision maker? We don't know. Socially. Why? No, no. We have to make that call. We made that call for people in the last option because we thought that made sense given the arguments that occurred to us there. Right? What is the argument in this instance? It's like all movements. It's like it's yeah. isn't specific to any state per se. It's hypothetical. Sure. Okay. Also, so, it's equivalent to the current average. Right? So I mean, it's already given. 
Can no, but the idea is you still have to give a reason for, like you have to be able to construct an interest set of interests, right? Like you have to argue on behalf of some entity that can hypothetically make this decision for us all. Right? The argument for if it's a state or if it's just hum- like good yeah. society in general would probably be very similar considering that you're talking about intellectual ability. So what society would want out of standardized intellectual abilities and what state would want out of standardized is probably very close. So it No, but why would a state want standardized intellectual ability? No? Yeah. yeah, so for for the people's, like for um, they would be really the people's weird. happiness, right? Because people want to be, I, I, don't want to feel the competition. It would be weird for a state to impose an average intellectual Yeah, okay, so, so society. And also like, I, I think states don't get the interest from the Sorry, you were saying something? Uh, Specialized, um, the people would be like fit, like what do you say? The, the this is brave new world, yeah, like yeah, it, it, it's like a general view, and there would be people who are suited to certain sectors. To but this is speaking only of intellectual ability. There's no whole government to make that decision. I mean, the idea is as in a, there is no authority that can make this decision. Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. if you isolate this decision to a particular country, be really weird. Like, can you imagine like only India will do this and then like smart Pakistanis will kick our ass apparently. <laughs> right? Like that would be cool. So how do we deal with that? Like people again. So they, see, if over time you will develop an instinct when you will look at motions and it will be very simple for you to see this. Like these, I had to think for a long time over the last 3-4 days to identify these steps because over doing like <coughs> debating for so long you just get into the pattern of figuring these things out more naturally. Okay? When you see motions like this, it's a straight pop out like this may government This is how people in the room abstract. Like the more abstract it gets, it tends to be easier to talk about this in generic terms. Okay? Given generic terms, alright, so the decision maker is people in a room, society at large, whatever. Um, so we go back to like what are the things you have to identify? Come on. Who are the stakeholders? People. Right? So this is one of those abstract ones, it's made nani. So decision maker sub janta. Given everyone's a decision maker in this instance, what are the interests? Equality. Is equality purely determined by intellectual ability? Also like the Have you seen that fat now thing fella who is going to be the wealthiest person soon? Like the one who killed people in that car, the Chota Ambani, what's his name? <laughs> I mean, now chota hai, you really bada. No, but you know that's that's essentially it, right? Like that person is going to be. Isn't that a good argument? Currently, a lot of people will access resources and ability, and access resources that are far beyond their ability. They are just born into it. In a world where everyone presumes that you have the same intellectual ability, is more likely to give options or access to everyone to try for things. But can't op easily argue that even if someone has equal intellectual abilities as you, they still have the possibility of having a better opportunity than you. Sure, and they might have better experiences that make them more attuned towards something, right? So what we're currently at is we don't really have a good reason for this notion yet, other than notions of equality, yeah? See, we can say that like all other charity. Like so that things which create inequality are very materialistic and something which can be broken down as compared to this intellectual inequality which we have, which necessarily promotes a meritocratic environment where a few people are like because of their intellect are so called destined to fail. This does not like this is something which we but cannot how, break out of. How many like if you have to make an like assumption about percentages out of every hundred people, how many People, do you think, are intellectual giants who are destined to fail? Uh, can we start off by saying that intellectual capabilities are often a product of the circumstances that you are in? But how does that help you as prop? Uh, because when you are giving someone an equal starting point, it means that now they are starting off equal. So whatever they do in school is still going to be... See, we are confused. And unfortunately this is true. I'm, just to be clear, I have lost a few guys. Because it's a brave new world motion, but less. It does not specify that you will have equal opportunity to anything. It just says you will have equal intellectual ability. 
an extrapolating opportunity. <coughs> but in the current status quo, we know that irrespective of ability, opportunity is not equal or not handed out on a meritocratic basis. Having equal intellectual ability does not automatically unlock that, right? Brave New World makes it very explicitly clear that it will unlock that mm -hmm. and helps you argue that, right? You want to say something? Uh, can we argue that meritocracy is bad enough itself and like argue basic things like in school what happens based on your percentage and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. The kind of life that you're forced to live because of your percentage and stuff like that. So it changes that and makes the world a better place to live for I think we're, we're getting that, I'll just I'll skip back to you, yeah? You can like, make the idea of hard work or like attributing success to a person much easier because now it's not based on what they are in their team or like. Getting that? Uh, I just had a doubt, if, if you talk... Okay. No, 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 that's fine, go, go for yeah. that. Like, uh, like, uh, hard work point I get it, but uh, like, um, if someone has the same intellectual ability, so like, do you keep the debate as the intellectual ability will continue to remain the same? Like, even if I study, uh, like, there will be a point where I will be concentrated, I won't understand more than that. Like, right. Is that how you frame the debate? You have to decide how to frame the debate. The point is intellectual ability is, and this is what I wanted to come to, I think both of you have started there and your questions is unlock the doors to this. What is intellectual ability? How do you define it? How do you understand it? Hmm? IQ? I, I don't know who said IQ, they, they managed to, sorry, didn't say. So IQ, right? But what does that mean? What is IQ translated? Like faster, you can ask concepts faster. Not necessarily. That's, that means your ability to learn, right? Mm -hmm. there, there, there can be, like, I don't know if you've seen... IQ, hmm? IQ translated to an extent to which you can reach as determined by the circuit. Like if I have a certain IQ, like it's something which, I've, which we are told that you can like Ambani, no. No, dude, Mota Ambani. No, not now not Mota Ambani. Like any Ambani child, right? They have no ability to speak of whatsoever. They were just born in like that family and other than the fact that they'll never get to eat non veg food in their life, their life's pretty sad. Yeah, but even then even that kid is told that like you can't become your father because you don't have that idea. No, his mom thinks he's become greater than his father. Did you see that? Okay, I am I'm, 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 I'm no. <laughs> Oh, never mind, okay. Forget Ambani's. No, I understand what you're trying to say. I think what you're missing out here is that intellectual ability doesn't translate into anything tangible. Not necessarily. There is no direct one is to one relation. There are people who are, like if you talk about leadership, there are people who are emotionally better at keeping a team together, who are much better leaders than the smartest people in the room. When you're talking about research, there are people who are better because of the amount of effort they put in, which has nothing to do with the amount of intelligence they have. Right? So the question becomes that stratification and diversification are still possible in a universe with equal intellectual ability. What does the removal of the idea of differential intellectual ability result in? Can we say that intellect in status quo is determined by birth? Like it's arbitrary. Lottery of birth is. Hmm. So okay. that is one uh, amount of stratification that you can't control after your birth. You can't work on your intellect to a greater extent as compared to your work ethics or hard work. That is one form of inequality that you can weed out if you give everyone an equal intellect. Sure, but I mean, there's that nature versus nurture thing, right? Like, yeah, we, so we don't have clarity on it, which is okay. part of the problem. But I, I think that's the beginnings of an argument. We'll, we'll just return to that. Yeah. Also, like when it comes to competition, when two people, well, somebody feels that they're not enough, like they're not smart enough to like do something, basically that idea is removed because now they know that everyone else is equal like me and the active effort that I put into my work will only get me ahead. So people will work harder, basically. And yeah, so it's, I think it's a combination. Yeah, yeah so, I so, so you understand that that fits yeah. into that, right? The Is idea. it against uh, Charles Darwin's survival of the fitness? Now it will be everyone at fitness. No, but the other point is fitness. The fitness for survival, or your fitness for survival, is not determined by your intellect, right? Hmm. By the way, extent, because if you're physically not that strong, but mentally you're strong, you create it by you create it. Heat. You know that right. they proved that it wasn't uh, intellect but opposable thumbs that help humans yeah. evolve, right? Every part in that is not deniable, mm -hmm. but still the one who conquered the other countries <coughs> were not far better in technology. Yeah, nee. see this is again, it's a problem of history, right? Prior, like there's actually someone who wrote about this, some like imperialist historian, I forgot his name, who said that it was the exact 50 year period 
where white people finally managed to figure out how to get to this part of the world. That was the only time in which they had come that they were superior to the native populations. Like the emperors of China and India would have kicked all of the Europeans' ass all over the place. Their combined armies put together just because they had those numbers and they had that technical skill, both in terms of technology, in terms of any sort of metric you want to look at. Right? The problem is intelligence is, and this is where the debate comes in, right? Intelligence is a fictional, imagined, contrived understanding of ability, okay, it only serves to make some people feel inadequate and some people feel more adequate, okay, like there are things that you can achieve, there are things that you can't achieve, how you do so or don't do so is usually a measure of how much effort and how much of yourself you put into something, the minute you understand that everyone is of the same intellectual ability, no, no thing is unachievable. Right? Is that like a good starting point? I think this motion is pretty trash by the way. I don't like it particularly. And I think this is a tenuous and weak argument. I would have loved to opt this. That being said, I think the best argument that one can make of this motion, right, is this one. Okay? That intellectual ability is a contrivance. Serves no purpose. It is like a, va it's what, it's a vanity metric. Yeah. It, it makes people feel better about themselves. But largely it is an understanding like, there's more than enough studies to show that IQ is like the tests are bad. Do you know what the first IQ test was like? Any anyone knows about the history of IQ tests? Okay, so there was this random French dude who decided he was going to measure IQ, and he brought a bunch of kids into his uh, room, and he gave them the same problem and like you just observe how they solved the problem. The problem he gave them was he said you have lost your ball in a park. Okay, how would you go about finding it? And he said there is a square park. Now figure it out. So he gave higher IQ points to kids who had like a structured or stepladder approach to make sure they covered the entire park. As opposed to kids who just said, first I'll go there, then I'll go in that corner, then I'll try here, then I'll check under that tree, you know, that sort of thing. And he used the results of this test to in his head prove that white kids were smarter than black kids. Because he had black kids in the room and white kids in the room and the white kids in the room performed better as per his test. The reasons as later have been found out had a lot to do with the fact that the black kids didn't know what a park or a ball was. No. They didn't have that, right? Like the, the word he used or whatever French word he used for park and ball. Like they didn't have an understanding of what he was talking about. Because these were literally kids that he got from a boat that had just picked up those kids from Africa. Right? So when he put them in a room and like part ball, they were just like, what are you born about? Right? So they obviously didn't do so well in the test. Now the point is IQ, as I said, is a contrivance. They have found ways to help and like at best they measure your ability to solve those specific problems that people put into IQ tests. Right? Computational ability or logical ability does not trounce hard work, does not trounce ambition and definitely does not trounce passion. I don't think these are good reasons to do away with like differences in intellectual ability at all. But since the motion demands it of it, like that's what I believe. Right? Okay. So this is a very bad motion. Yeah. But like, as a counter to the hard work point, mm -hmm. if all comes in says yeah. the motion says there will be everyone will have same intellectual ability. Again the same question. So you will continue to have the same irrespective of how hard you work, your intellect there will be a gap on how much you can think or how much you can expect. So again probably come back to the same point of the brave new world of stagnation. I, I don't think so because I, I think what you're mistaking here is intellectual ability is not the outcome. The outcome is what you achieve. Right? So you could either have one Einsteinian guy putting 10 hours into some rocket project or you could have 20 guys <coughs> of like the same ability who are not that smart putting in 10 hours of work each to achieve the same objective. But it's the objective that determines it, right? Not the intellectual ability per se that goes into it. <coughs> so the point is if everyone's of the same intellectual ability, it only becomes a function of how much effort you put into it or your ability to imagine what it should be like. So your imagination and your hard work are the only keys to unlock success and they have nothing to do with this contrivance of intellectual ability. Okay? Uh, you were going to say something. Something along the lines of uh, can the obsolete intellect can also stick to what extent you can imagine what you can do. Yeah. So, in that case, there will be stagnation. No, but that will be a different shader, right? Like, the difference between, say, Steve Jobs or, like, 
say what you want. Okay, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are like visionary founders or whatever. Bill Gates is probably a hundred times smarter than either of them. Genuinely, like in terms of like what like basic intellectual abilities, programming, coding, all those problem solving skills. But because Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are visionaries, like the guy just imagine he's going to go to Mars and then he kept building rockets until some of those rockets look like they work and then he blows up rockets in space and NASA says good job and then gives him more money to build more rockets. So the fact that he was able to imagine as a son of like a white supremacist in South Africa that he was one day going to be able to build companies that could eventually make him a billionaire. I'm not sure he has any technical ability whatsoever. Okay, so it's not really good. Right, like in the idea that you're, like then the differentiator will become your vision. Which is not a bad thing. You can say that it's a better thing to differentiate on if you had to differentiate than intellectual ability. Sir, so, in the of play out, like uh, though being having intellect and equal intellect, but as the field is not leveled, as environment and somewhere luck factors also play. Yeah, sure. No, but I think then the response becomes you're comparing it to status quo. In status quo, you have all of those things and you have this contrivance of intellectual ability. Right? If you remove this, you at least make it more even as a playing field, even though it remains uneven than without it. Okay? And the other part is you look at like how a society is structured around intellectual ability, man. Like, I'm sure that, that I think so some study on like people who topped Harvard Business School as opposed to people who like just performed okay and they saw no correlation to success and grades or topping the batch, right? Even though there will be a presumption that people who top the batch are probably better. Like we also have this and yeah, that, that helps with the contrivance thing, right? Like there's an understanding that if you are an academic topper or that if you perform in very specific narrow fields, you're considered to be more of an intellectual than others, right? And I think philosophy or intellect can come from lived experiences which are far more engaging and far more educational than anything you can learn in a classroom. The Mohinat Deshash prefers the world without the without the new learning. Neuralink uh, is a highly valued, a highly valued startup has invented Neuralink technology which allows people's consciousness to be irre irreversibly uploaded into a powerful supercomputer and maintained indefinitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go through the process, guys. What's happening? Storing of consciousness. Irreversible. What does that imply? You can't. That your consciousness will be permanent. You can't delete it. Your consciousness will be permanently available to access. Yeah. No, the question is: Does that mean you, as a human being, are, are, is, is are dead? No. Doesn't matter. Your consciousness will be stored in the computer. Black mirror. Yeah, black mirror. No, but there, there are way too many science fiction ones. We're not going down that road because then we'll connect it to other things in that universe. No, okay. No, the idea is if you are stored on a computer, is your original version still alive? Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. It depends upon what you define. It depends on what government defines. It's not clear in the motion. It's not clear, right? It says irreversibly. It just means you can't pull it out. But it doesn't necessarily. If you assume consciousness to be something more abstract, then you would assume that it's irreversible and that means a human body that has your consciousness is dead. If you instead look at consciousness as something that is replicable in programming, code and in memory, then yeah, you can exist, like coexist, right? Now, which one do you, should you choose as government? <coughs> coexist. Why coexist? So your comparative is coexist? There's a human being and there's a clone of them on a computer or just on a computer and the human is there. What creates more chaos? Clones. Coexist. Coexist clone. You want to argue against Neuralink? What should you choose? Coexist. Yes, thank you. Okay, first. Right? Second. So that's changed. Who's the decision maker? People. No, it's people. You have to prefer a world without. So you are the world. Right? And uh, stakeholders? The person who's conflict, every individual who's conscious yeah. is being stored. Okay. Who else? And what is the purpose of setting The one who is storing. Not, not only the people the who's who's consciousness who's consciousness who's consciousness who's consciousness who's consciousness but like society in general, not only the ones whose consciousness is being stored. Sure. But like are there any particular members in society who would be more affected than others? Yeah, people who are related to the dead. Like, no way. Okay, family of dead people? Family. 
Anything else beyond family of like coexisting people? Coexisting, not dead. Yeah. Who said dead? They're alive. Uh, anything else? Very important people from history. Right. Depends on what you aim to do or Who is determining what gets done by? Remember. The world is one thing. What does the info site say? say? Also criminals. A startup, right? There's a commercial entity that has developed this capacity. Okay? Presumably. And what does that mean for people who need this but can't access it? So there might be people who physical ailments, uh, paralysis, right? Like this opens up the possibility of a lot of things including <coughs> say if someone is completely paralyzed, you be able to give them a robot body, mm -hmm. right? So what happens then? Anyway, so moving past that, right? not, not what happens then. Uh, in this motion, you've identified those three things. If the decision maker is people, what are the interests of people? In this context, in the context of startup, uh, brain copy in computer. To preserve the consciousness of people, maybe if there are family members to value them or if they are famous people, they to uh, tap into the consciousness. Preserve their intelligence, experience. No, but can we ask ourselves why and under what circumstances you clone your consciousness onto a computer? When you have, when you feel the Like if you lost the love, do I? Wow, okay, this, 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 this took like a sudden turn and black hole and bunches of things. Huh? The phenomena of after life. No, but why is that? Why is the phenomena of after life a reason for me to take a copy of my head in the computer? If I go to Pata Lok, I feel like I'm going to get my head. 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 Because the whole perseverance and making coming and all that was to save like the king for after life. So the consciousness. Also, is on that term. No, the preservation of consciousness, but the question of preservation of consciousness only comes at a particular point, right? I think it's this is a privilege that like certain people only have. Guys, before we get into whether it's a privilege or not, and who has access to it or not, why, what circumstance would make you want to do this? Medical you want ailment, you feel that you will lose your consciousness. Medical ailments are what? Like your body is somehow incapacitated, your consciousness is does not have a very comfortable home at present. You want to preserve your consciousness. You feel that will benefit people. You could just Why would when would you want to preserve your consciousness? Like your smartphone? No. Would a two-year-old want to preserve his consciousness because he got like three golden stars at his Montessori school? Yes, thank you. The only situation in which you would choose to make a remember that copy of your consciousness, your existence diverges past that point. The odds are that people would choose to indulge in this sort of procedure either before a major event, right? Like you want to preserve like yourself before you got shot off into space. You want to preserve who you are before you go into prison. Some either major life changing experience for the negative or death. You would want to preserve your consciousness before that, right? Make sense? Yes. There are models of having two people together. I don't want to think that I am going through that. Yeah, so I'm I'm about to go to war. I put a copy of my consciousness so that like uh, instead of receiving a dear John letter from my girlfriend, like she has someone to talk to, and so it's not really long this way. And then like I I come back from the war, and then she tells me that she loves the computer version of me more <laughs> because it, it hasn't I, I, it, the computer version of me hasn't seen the horrors of war and doesn't like scream out in the middle of the night and and, and get really upset with like loud explosions or whatever. PTSD. No, I can't believe you guys are laughing. See, see, see. <laughs> see, see, um, no, so the idea becomes that we should be able to recognize who the people we are talking about are, right? The stakeholders here are the people who would want such a procedure. It's safe to assume that they would want such a procedure if they were worried about their existence, worried about their life, or worried about their future. Okay? So, therefore, why should you not have this as an alternative? What does this do? What are the problems with this? It creates an unrealistic expectation of a human being because you are accessing consciousness of a person like in terms of this PTSD example. Mm -hmm. That person is not real but now you expect human beings to be this like unflawed version of themselves. Uh, how? I, I don't know why you would assume that a computer version of me. Like, I think it doesn't yeah. PTSD. 
Like just imagine it, like get pissed off at your reads through all your messages because sorting your computer. Like, what do you want to do? It can also be the case that you become a better version of yourself in a good way. In, in an environment where you are in a computer, what is the first thing that happens to you? What is important about living in a human body? What is your most immediate connection to the world around you? Perpetuity. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what perpetuity? No, no. Like, how, how do I contact the world? How do I relate to the world? Senses. Senses? Like, you realize senses, emotions, thinking, feeling are all because of, like, they have a physical existence because of glands and weird groupy sh- shite inside your cranium, right? Now, if you get put in a computer, can you truly predict how you will behave? If you lack mirror neurons, will you have empathy? What? That depends on how you read people. Yeah, yeah. No, we know where empathy comes from. Like scientifically, scientifically, yeah, it's called mirror neurons. Like, how do we define So there is, okay, two things. Uh, there's something called mirror neuron. I'm going into biology. There are some things called mirror neurons, okay? These are, okay, I'll start from the beginning. There was an experiment that was being done in a lab in Italy where there was a monkey that was tied to an MRI and they were studying the monkey while it was eating peanuts and they were seeing the changes in its brain waves. They, like, un, unplanned and unannounced, some random scientists walked into that lab while that MRI was going on. And so the scientists on the other side near where the sensor, like usually a screen and all, right? Or like, oh, what is this idiot doing? He's walked into our lab, he's going to ruin our results. The monkey was just sitting and this human going, dude, what the heck? I was alone with my, the nuts I was going to eat. I'm not going to say my nuts. I'm going to avoid that. So the scientists reached across, ate one of the nuts that were kept on the side that can notionally be attributed to be possessions of the monkey. And he ate that nut. And when the scientists looked at the MRI record, while the human being was eating the nut, the same neurons were lighting up in the monkey's brain as when the monkey was eating the nuts. So they were like, the MRI machine is broken, they sent it back to the lab to get it fixed. And the lab said, no, the MRI machine is fine, you guys are broken. So then there was a lot of argument like back and forth and they replicated the experiment. And they realized that human beings feel what they see. So if you see someone doing something, you feel the same emotions as if you are doing that thing. And that's based on something called mirror neurons in your head. Humans have them, dogs have them, elephants have them, dolphins have them. And that is the basis of all empathy. The reason you feel empathy towards someone is because you, when you visualize what's happening to them, you feel like it's happening to you. That is why if someone tells you something really creepy, you also start getting like like the heebie-jeebies. Like if I talk to you about like a small hairy spider walking slowly across your arm and touching each one of the hairs on your arm. Because you need to have that. Right? Like that's just creepy, right? So you tend to feel that when you imagine it. And if it's happening to someone in front of you, it works. That's why a lot of footballers these days play FIFA a lot. Visualizing and seeing how football is being played activates the same neurons in their body. And so when they start playing football, they play football the same way. Like that's why a lot of like sports people spend all their time watching sports videos and stuff. This is scientifically established to be the basis of empathy. If you are code on a computer, you don't have mirror neurons anymore. We aren't clear about what, what happens to your empathy or your ability to feel. Right? So it makes you less emotional perhaps. Makes you less connected to human existence. Makes you less human. Right? So, <coughs> what are the reasons against having it though? Why should you not want a world which has this neural network? Can it be along the principle of this, how human life is supposed to be, um, what do you call it? it's supposed to end. So the moment you have this option of preserving your consciousness, you can just leave. Second thing is, you tell me commercially, if I have a computer full of the richest people in the world who have died in the last five years, and all their brains are stored in that computer, and I'm just waiting for something to happen, what's the biggest business opportunity in the world right now? Building robot bodies to house those fathers? Mm-hmm. So then you'll have a robot of money? Yeah. Right? So basically what you are creating is a new tiered hierarchical system where the rich live forever and the poor die. Mm. And that's a bad thing. And it's pretty hard for opposition to argue that we are a bad one. For startup, I commercially karega. Commercially karega, like, and it's pretty expensive. Like one would imagine this kind of technology is pretty uh, cutting edge. It's not likely to be cheap. 
preserving someone in perpetuity on storage systems would be crazy. You know, there's so many billion, like I don't know, the count of neurons in your head is so high that the amount of information that needs to be stored to store your consciousness is also likely to be great. Again, added commercial costs. So for all those reasons, it's safe to presume that it would be really expensive. If it's really expensive, it means it will be accessible only to a few and that's just wrong, right? What if opposite say TF3 metal? They'll use that data to like sell products and services. They'll mine your head for data. Then what? Can we, can we make an argument that it's like, it's a good thing that humans die because humans would like be really alienated living forever. Like something yeah. like that, something about those things. But the point is if I'm a program, I can probably set up a self governance switch, right? Okay, so just saying that. Then there's no oh, point of having a consciousness stored if you want to actually... No, but it's up to my consciousness, huh? What if my consciousness wants to be around to see my like dog's daughter's birthday or some kind? Weird shit happens. Maybe at a point of time, it can your consciousness. Sorry, just a sec. That is. I can't possibly make that choice at one point in my life and then I have to sleep with that choice forever. No, so the idea can be that you allow for a switch off choice at whatever point no, of time. But it says indefinitely, right? In the motion. Hmm? It says that it's going to stay indefinitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. But that's weird. Then Actually, that's a good argument for prop then. Then you can say that having it indefinitely is weird because that choice should not be something you take away. But in countries which don't allow you to commit suicide, that would be a problem also. Like the right to end your life. So that can be one argument, but it's a bit sketchy. You were saying something? Uh, like we can have something like at a point of time, we have such options. People necessarily lose their value of life if they are attached. As in I don't really care now that much that I'll die because I think I still have my consciousness. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid argument. I think it will change the value of life and existence for some people as opposed to other people and that's not fair. So he was just impacting about probably just mess up families. Like your father has died physically but your consciousness is still there. But yeah, yeah. that killing the idea of suicide. Like if I am suffering from mental health, even if I commit suicide, I will still be suffering from mental health issues. No, I mean, that would assume that while suffering from mental health issue, I allowed and uh, agreed to someone make a copy of me. Right? Yeah. It's not like everyone will have a copy made of them. So, that, that is in essence the most effective thing. Now, the other thing, so there's a Roald Dahl story, okay, where there was this, there's a doctor who says, like, who talks to a fellow doctor and says, I will cut out your brain. When you die, your brain has the ability to live for 200 years. The rest of your body dies much earlier. So what we do is we put it in a basin and we try to figure out ways for your brain to communicate. So the guy, he has a terminal illness, so he says, okay, why not? So when he dies, they take his brain out and they put it in a basin and it's alive. But they're still trying to figure out how to communicate. They say one of its eyes, so it can see. So this man was like, he was a bookish man, like terminal illness had made him quite, a, quite an ass to his wife. And he didn't let his wife smoke. So when the wife came in front of the brain, she kept smoking in front of it to annoy the brain, right? So the idea is when you take existence away and you cut out very specific, very inherent aspects of existence and boil it down to something so concentrated like a consciousness without giving it any clarity on how it may be able to exercise that consciousness, speak, engage with the outside world, that is problematic in the extreme because any one of those things might be an issue. Like what if you switch off that computer? Like it might be stored indefinitely, but like you can make sure that it can never speak. Your ability to control or mess with that brain or that consciousness is much higher in a software system. Your ability to protect that consciousness is much lower, right? And you're basically signing over your consciousness to a startup. Can you sell your body to a startup? How? You can't do it. How? Now, hypothetically, in my brain, I'll put like copies everywhere. No, I'll, I'll yell at Trump from his cell phone and hack it. No, like, seriously. Anything, guys? Like, why should we, why should we allow for a system where we, like, rights accrue to us because we are human? When we put our consciousness on a computer, we become less than human. That means that our rights as a consciousness and as a human are unknown and unclear. In such a circumstance where we can't know 
who those rights should accrue, how they should be divided, or whether they need to be replicated for that entity. We don't think we should go ahead with this. We think a world that opens up that Pandora's box is a poorer world for them. We think there is definitely scope in the future to have like robot bodies to take up consciousnesses from people whose bodies are somehow flawed or have issues with them and to give them greater capacity. There might even be the possibility of allowing robot bodies to be controlled by a human mind or a human body from a distance. Right? Like drone strikes and stuff that are happening today. What's the difference? Right? There's a guy sitting in a room like in the US and he's like playing a video game and he's killing terrorists in Iraq and Syria. Right? Like how is that different from like a robot brain stored at a startup running, like not robot brain, a human consciousness running robot bodies on the moon. It's not very different. So the idea then becomes what's the problem with this? It's because it creates too much confusion as to what the rights of that entity are. It also makes that consciousness extremely vulnerable to all sorts of like, well, actually, and so that's not a good idea. Okay. Again, not the best motion you have taken for case construction. Alright, so guys. To quickly review what we've covered thus far, okay, when you look at a motion, it's very important for you to identify three main things, right? What is the change being spoken of? Who is the decision maker? And who are the stakeholders? Important caveat when understanding stakeholders are that stakeholders come with differing levels of importance. Right? The most important stakeholder is likely to be the one who is closest to the issue and is most affected by it. But the one who is closest to the decision maker can often be the one that actually turns where the debate lies. So it's important to keep that in mind. The second point is for the decision maker, because that is who you are speaking to. That is who the debate is addressed to, right? You have to look at what their interests are, what their constraints are, and what patterns exist in their behavior. And once you put these six things together, and you look at the motion, it should make it very easy for you to say, X should do Y to accomplish Z as a kind of case statement. And everything that follows from it can be the beginning of a pretty strong first proposition speech. All right? Within an argument itself that follows from this, it's very important to make sure you start with your conclusion. Okay? It's in what's in the movies and TV shows called a cold open. Uh, you should check out Brooklyn Nine-Nine's cold open. It's on YouTube. It's cold. But yeah, like that sort of thing. Okay? And Start off with what you are trying to accomplish, what the benefit of it is and why it changes things so that adjudicators remember that. And then make sure that when you conclude your analysis, that you end with an example that also ties that outcome together. Because that will make it stickiest and most valuable for an adjudicator. Remember, like the people judging you are human beings. Okay? They are people you are familiar with, they are people who are looking for reasons to get done with this exercise as quickly as possible, just like you are. They want an easy decision, they want it to be done for them. The easier you make it for them to arrive at a decision, the more likely that they will arrive at the decision you make it easier for them to arrive at. So if you give them clear ideas of what to remember and what to say, like if you spoon feed them the word saying, government won because they managed to prove X and Y should do Z, it just makes everything far more likely to for you to win. And that is the problem that happens in a lot of debates. The idea of this talk was to help you arrive at that, instead it became lots of abstract uh, Conversations about existence, uh, brain power, intellect, and whatnot, because world's 2020 motions were terrible. Yeah, that okay. but yeah, that's that's my final word on that. Any questions, guys? Do you do you was there anything in this like was there anything in constructing in this way that's unfamiliar to you? Is this not how you approached case construction prior? Like, how would you do case construction otherwise? You just look at the motion and then like the first arguments that pop into your head. Yeah. yeah all the material, <laughs> no, but the important thing is A, guys, your next tournament is UADC, right? The main one. Next, next year. What? Next year. Next year. Sure. No, but the idea is when you are prepping for any of these tournaments, like whoever is the team that's going, there's usually lots of practices around that as well for other teams that may not be going, right? Like, so if uh, I'm assuming that teams were going to Worlds, there were lots of BB practices where people were practicing who weren't necessarily going to Worlds. So I think what you guys should be doing is making sure there are practices for the next major tournament where people who hope to participate in it in the next year 
are participating as much as possible in the practices to get experience. And then you should have those practices at the other end of the tournaments as well. Like people who have, for example, gone to work should be practicing BP with you guys for a few weeks so that whatever they have most proximately learned is conveyed to you as quickly and as effectively as possible. But past that point, like this is an intellectual exercise. And I know I, I, I shat on intellectual ability quite a bit over the course of our conversation, but it's a vanity metric. And it is a vanity metric. But what really helps is understanding that there are patterns that make it easier for you to do certain things. Okay? There are some people for whom if you give them a motion, they will very naturally come up with three very good arguments which would be ideal for government. But without this structure, that's not a hundred percent. If you evolve what is what is the most convenient and most effective structure for you, you'll be much better at debating over time. And like I know it's the first few times it'll feel alien, it'll feel very weird to do it in this weird sort of structured way. You think you will lose out because you're not actually um, you know open to all sorts of ideas and you're focusing more on doing it in this step by step way. But the more often you do it in this step by step way, the easier it will become for it to become almost natural and you'll be way more effective. So highly recommended. Uh, please figure out your own structure in doing it as well. But this has served me well and hopefully do the same.